Welcome, Helena. Thank you. It's such an honor and a privilege the, to be here with you now. I'm, your work has been one of the greatest inspirations to me. Every time I've watched you speak or read one of your books, it's kind of blown another part of understanding and just being able to see the whole big picture of the many crises that we're facing today and not only to understand and articulate the complexity of them but to see a clear pathway and a solution to them it's just such a um an amazing body of work that you've been doing and um and so you've been the founder of Local Futures and a pioneer of the new economy movement. And you've been promoting an economics of personal, social and ecological well-being for more than 30 years. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely. It's actually more than 40 years now, I hate to admit, but it is. <laughs> yeah, more than 40 years. Um, and... So you, you often talk about the interrelated crises that we're facing, social, ecological, and spiritual, and that the moving towards a systemic shift towards localization can really address all of these seemingly disparate issues. And how can a shift to local help? How would that make a difference? I think really to understand that, we need to have that bigger picture where we first of all recognize that the global economic system, which has been going on and escalating and developing over many generations, has now become such a big system with so much money being created at the top that we have a sort of enormous balloon of fake money but that fake money is affecting everything that lives. So it's actually part of supporting giant monopolies that are imposing a consumer monoculture, beamed into every yurt in Mongolia, into the, you know, every corner of the world. And it's disseminating a type of psychological pollution, robbing people of self-respect. It's having a disastrous effect on Gaia herself, because it's based on transporting things back and forth, importing and exporting the same product. So this gigantic, really hot air balloon, it's, it really doesn't have real power, but because most of us are not looking at it, we don't realize that transitioning away from depending on, supporting, and unwittingly supporting this system with our ideas shifting towards a very conscious path of strengthening local economies worldwide brings with it all these massive benefits. And this is not just a theory, it's something that is being demonstrated around the world, that when people start building more human-scale structures so that we're actually more dependent on human-scale institutions, so when we pick up a phone and we want to talk to the head of a business, it's actually a human being on the phone. It's not an algorithm. It's not a robot. And there are more visible and accountable chains of connection. And sometimes these connections actually go across the world. But it is about place-based businesses that are more consciously aware of where they're getting the resources, they have more contact with the consumer, so it goes all the way from the extraction from the natural world to the consumers. A chain of more human scale, connected, and aware, conscious uh, choices and relationships. So it's very much about consciousness, but it's consciousness of these structures that many people are not so aware of. Mm. And, and so if we're just gonna unpack couple of things like two things in particular really stood out and as like an analysis of the problem or the system one was fake money and the other one was when you mentioned trade back and forward sending things the same product what what did you mean about the trade is that talking about like global trade deals yes it absolutely is talking about global treaties that have actually been a, a process going on, particularly since the Second World War, of 
through really good intentions on the part of many, many people, there was a thinking after the world, Second World War that the way to prevent another world war, the way to prevent another depression was to integrate every economy across the world. Now, as it happens, around the table were also global banks and global corporations that were already far too big, actually. But this integration, which governments embarked on, which meant rolling out and, and subsidizing a global infrastructure for more and more trade so that virtually every country was essentially opening its doors to giant businesses, allowing through free trade treaties, big corporations to have free access to resources, to cheap labor, to markets in the industrialized countries, and with no restrictions, no tariffs, no nothing. They could move in and out. Now, that process of trade treaties, often promoted by well-intentioned people, has actually been quite disastrous. Because what's happened is it's ended up supporting businesses. It's become so big that the people inside those businesses cannot be aware, really deeply aware, in an experiential way, of their impact on people around the world. And that includes the impact as advertisers, how they actually affect the self-respect of young children. It includes the impact on the trees, on the water. That experience of the impact has been reduced to distant numbers. And then all the time this pressure as a machine, the global publicly traded corporation, is being pressured by shareholders to just become bigger and bigger, and the absolute focus has to be profit. Now, that has also led to countries ending up importing and exporting the same product. So across the world, every day, we literally are importing and exporting the same product. So the U.S. now exports a billion and a half tons of beef and veal a year, turns around and imports a billion and a half tons of beef and veal every year. Why? And how can it be that this is happening when we talk about climate change? How can it be that the U.K. exports as much butter and milk as it imports? Why would we do that? Well, I would argue the main reason that's happening is because those global arrangements are simply not recognized either by the environmentalists or even by most government people. There's not really been anyone in charge. There's almost no one that's had the brief to step back and look at this global economic system and global trade. If they had, um, as we have, you know, I've helped to start something called the International Forum on Globalization. And there were about 40 of us from around the world studying the impact of this and realizing that it was the main driver of climate change. It was the main driver of massive insecurity in the, in the workplace, a main driver of such intense competition for work. Part of this insane trade includes literally fish being flown across the world, from Norway, from Tasmania, from the US, fish being flown to China to be deboned or filleted, flown back again. Apples being flown across the world to be washed and flown back again. This is going on routinely. And I actually first discovered in the mid 70s that already then, because of this crazy support of global business and global trade, Sweden was sending potatoes to Italy by road to be put, to be washed and put in plastic bags and then sent back by road to Sweden. This was because for these giant businesses, they were obliged to go looking for the cheapest labor to do something like wash potatoes. So now it's across the world and it's being flown and it must really be the first place to look to deal with climate change. So this is why it's you know, vitally important that we raise awareness about this. Yeah, I, um, I think it was through your work that I became first aware of the problem with tech solutionism. Like I hadn't really understood 
I, th- I obviously had an inkling that it was wrong just to say, oh, we just need to create new technologies to be able to solve these problems. But I don't think I was really aware of the amount of um, kind of capital that was going into supporting this idea of a solution um, and how corrupt that was in a way. Um, and kind of the whole greening of certain capital, capital schemes. Um, uh, I'd love to you to touch a little bit on like why new technologies aren't a real solution and what is a real solution. Yeah, I think I'm so glad you're interested in that. And by the way, we need more women to be looking at this because I think women have a deeper connection to the earth. I think this is something I've seen in every culture, even in traditional cultures. And we very, very much need the balance between more female and more male energy and between men and women. But particularly now, we need to realize that we are dealing with an economic system that has been shaped essentially by men. And that, that's why it's become so techno-obsessed and why it's become so obsessed with bigger, faster, uh, and, and ever more competitive ways of doing things. So there's this fundamental problem, not with technology per se. We have to look at what kind of technologies we want to support and what we don't want to support. What is very problematic today is that tiny little things like a mobile phone or an iPad that seem perfectly harmless and also small have an enormous footprint. And their footprint includes scarce minerals and mining that's destroying whole countries. And, of course, there are limits to these resources. And because these technologies have been created by giant monopolies that generally don't pay tax and that have amassed more and more wealth and power, we have to be really aware now what we what we need to do about that. Because it's not just a question of these scarce minerals, it's a question of these giants are imposing a system with built-in obsolescence, manufactured so that you cannot repair them, manufactured so that people need to update and buy new every year. It's, it's a madness in a world where really the majority of people realize that there are limits to resources and that we need to be producing our industrial products really carefully and why not do it in such a way that lots of people can be involved in both the production and in the repair of technologies that we would deem really useful for humanity. So we have to basically, particularly after COVID now, we need to be willing to take a big breath and a pause and carefully look at what I see as a very important fork in the road Because of this constellation, which was particularly aggravated after the Second World War, but even more in the mid-80s, with a new era of global trade treaties, this escalation in speed, which really, you know, over the last 30, 35 years, the speed in the deregulation of trade, not just in goods, but in money, the financial markets, this deregulation of those giant global traders is responsible for most of the serious crisis we're facing. And most people who are looking at the world situation will tell you that things have gone from bad to worse in the last 30 years. And I just want to remind people that Understanding why, understanding that there's actually a very clear path, a very single thread that we can focus on to deal with this vast system that if we don't understand how or why the world has gone from bad to worse, if we sort of know that we don't really like big business having so much power, but we have no idea about the actual mechanisms whereby they gain so much power and are continuing to gain more power, then we really are blind and in the dark, you know, ending up dealing with just single issues 
and sort of fighting against what seems to be a multi-headed monster where every day there seems to be a new mega crisis. So this is actually, <clears throat> what I'm trying to say here is really very, very positive. You know, it's, it doesn't sound that way. I'm talking about this big system, but it's only so big because we have not been paying attention. And I also, you know, you mentioned too about the fake money. We really need to recognize that when we have a system where fewer and fewer people benefit, those people who are benefiting are actually weaker and weaker. We have the numbers because now the truth is that more than 99% of humanity, and I mean much, much more, it's roughly 99.9% .9 of humanity, have not had any part in negotiating or pushing for these trade and finance deals. It's a tiny minority. And even those people who were pushing for them were not really aware of the huge damage they were doing. So I, I really feel it's helpful to see that blindness from the majority, but even to the tiny minority pushing for this craziness is really the problem. So waking up and addressing and looking at uh, is what I call big picture activism. And that's how we can all play a role. We can all play a role by just becoming more aware of the fundamentals, speaking out, sharing the websites, sharing the films, the voices, as you're doing now, which I think is, you know, it's just the most important work we can do. I'm probably jumping the gun for you. Maybe you want to ask those things later. Yeah, but yeah. Shall I come back? Because if you, if you want me to, I wouldn't mind saying something a bit more about the fake money. Yeah, that would be great. Is that in relation to debt? Well, it is in relation to debt, but I think it's unfortunate when people only focus on the debt part. The, we need to understand the money system holistically. All of this with big picture activism, from my point of view, is to understand the connections and see the bigger picture. So with a money system, what's happened for a very long time is that as the economy became more and more global, and some of this goes back already to the 1400s in Italy, where ways of accounting, ways of allowing banks to pretend to their depositors that they were doing something other than what they were doing. This is part of this whole trajectory of a global system where the, the global traders gain more and more power. So the banks developed what's called fractional reserve. People thought that the money they put in the bank was actually sitting there in the bank, waiting for them when they wanted to use it. But no, the banks became gradually more and more able to pretend that they had much more money than they did and to create money out of lending more than what they had. There were also changes in accounting that allowed this to happen in a way that, again, allowed the banks to amass more and more wealth. Now, up to a certain point, all of this can be fine, but and what I'm saying is that once you start understanding about localizing, let, let, me, let me go back, let me just finish more about the global trend. So where this gained a momentum that we really have to think of as just psychopathic in the sense that we're talking about people who are so out of touch with the reality on the ground that they allowed, even after 2008, when the whole world woke up to the fact that by this time, banks and financial institutions were able to use our lives, our mortgages, as this tradable commodity, and across the world trade in envelopes of people's lives, names, places, no idea who they were, no idea where they were. We had been reduced to this anonymous numbers that were being swapped in a, like a gambling casino. Now this freedom of the global financial institutions to trade in this way and the lack of regulation, the lack of oversight, which meant that after 2008 when everybody knew we needed regulation, but we were then told, no, too big to fail. We'll just have to let them 
keep playing in their casino. So this has continued. And all the time, yes, this has meant that banks have been lending to governments so that most of the money in circulation is actually money that they have created as a debt to government. And then, of course, there's the debt to the individuals, there's the debt to businesses, and we really need to have a big wake-up, we need to have a big movement that starts exposing this for what it is. And let's remember that we don't need to demonize any particular individuals, we don't need really to start punishing, we just need to be clear about the absolute need to end this game and to do it with as little suffering as possible. But really what we're talking about is a democratic process whereby we, the citizens, we are clearly informed of our choices because we do not realize that right now, every price in our marketplace, when you and I go to buy some bread, when we go to buy some water, when we go to buy any of our basic needs or anything for that matter, the price in the marketplace is an artificial construct born of a set of regulations at the local, regional and national level and deregulation at the global level. Subsidies for those who don't pay tax and squeezing every business and individual operating within the national arena for, for taxes. So we have this incredibly unfair system where every single business, as I say, at the national level is squeezed with taxes, squeezed with regulations, many of which are so, not just stupid, that they're insane, but they are outrageous. You know, forbidding farmers from growing and selling heirloom varieties. Um, right now, Japan is in a battle to try to protect its heirloom seeds and its great variety of rice. Big global economic corporate pressures are trying to push the national government to end a law that protects those seeds. This is a process that's been going on all around the world and we have not been consulted. Most people have not had any idea. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to be careful that I don't, you know, I don't talk too much about the negative and then not remind people that there are things that are being done that are very positive. I think it's, it's, it's really vital to our understanding that we, can under, that we can see how the system works. Because then when, like, it, because such a huge system like this that has so many people's vested interests into its success, um, who have power, it's, it's, they'll, it will do whatever it can to make itself seem like the, the most valid and only option. I think it's very telling that for many people, this global capitalist deregulated market also symbolizes security, when actually it's the greatest violation of human rights that there ever could be, but it symbolizes security and stability. Um, because it's done such a fantastic job um, about demonizing any idea of like decentralization or kind of anarchic, anarchic structure. It could be equated with like decentralized structure, but, it's a, but in reality, that word is seen as um, a horror, a ho like a horror for most people. Um, and yeah, and, and I think it's interesting that it's done everything it can to put the onus on the consumer and the individual to try and kind of defeat any um, responsibility of the system to pay, to be accountable for what it's for its own actions um, because it's so dehumanized. I was watching um, Annie Leonard's recent film or the story of plastic this new film which is great and it talks about how the term litterbug was created by some of the plastics monopolies um, which I wasn't I didn't know about um, and and yeah this emphasis always on the consumer cleaning up when actually it's a it's a materials it's a resources problem and Annie Lennon uses the metaphor of 
Um, it's like spooning out the bathtub instead of turning up the tap, um, which I think is great. And, and, in, and in contrast, at the beginning, you were talking a lot about awareness and contact and connection to cycles. And it's like, even if it's not down to the individual, it's a more systemic thing. It's like, as soon as we can be aware of our peace within a chain, we can have we can start to create our own environment and create our own communities that can then enable the spread of alternative and different ways of engaging with, um, with the economy and with, with our lives. Um, I found farmers markets to be some of, like, of such an inspiring example of this. And it's another part of your work that I've really, I've really loved. Um, how, how do you think farmers markets can embody um, like an alternative way? Well, first of all, the best way to understand this picture of how the global economy has become so destructive and why local economies are this win-win-win solution is to look at food and farming and to understand that driving people away from the land and particularly in the modern era, replacing them with more and more fossil fuels has never, ever meant that human beings were producing more food per unit of land. What it meant was that it was efficient because it was able to use machinery and technology to produce food and supposedly liberate people to do something more meaningful. And also remember when it started, you know, we had already had colonialism and slavery and maybe people standing on some giant plantation behaving like a machine day in and day out, when you had that situation, replacing them with fossil fuels and technology looked like progress. However, even in my native country of Sweden, this major leap in progress after the Second World War meant driving people away, not just from the land, but from smaller towns and villages into bigger and bigger very energy intensive cities, high rise, the cement, all of it using lots of fossil fuels and isolating people from each other and from the land. Now, the localization movement has been going on, particularly again, you know, in these last 30 years. That's, we've been pioneers and we've been promoting local food and particularly farmers markets, consumer and uh, communities, consumer supported agriculture and so on for more than 30 years. And what we're seeing is just this wonderful, wonderful win-win where people are actually in love with these markets because they, they say, I think partly what's going on is that it is something deep in our DNA that connection to food, that connection to the people who grew it, the connection to the land, to the animals, to the plants, we evolved in that way. So it's sort of in our DNA. And what's happening is this beautiful also coming together of these farmers, many of whom had been pushed by this global food system to produce standard monocrops that not only meant that they had to grow species that actually weren't suited to the land or the climate, but every apple, every avocado had to be a standard size, otherwise they got burnt, they had to fit the machinery for harvesting, for washing, for the supermarket shelves, completely unnatural. And of course, on the land, the monocropping meant that it was so unnatural that you had to use lots of chemicals and fungicides and all kinds of unnatural ways of trying to squeeze something out of the land. And the land, of course, is dying. You know, it's been turning into dust bowls. It's been going on for a long time. And tragically, because of blindness, our national governments have continued down this path of bigger and bigger monocultures for export rather than diversifying for national needs, regional and local. From the bottom up, we've helped to pioneer this movement where on a small scale all around the world, farmers and consumers have come together 
And whether it's in Beijing or Sydney or London, New York, there's this movement also from the big cities. And it is a very, very powerful, very inspiring movement that is demonstrating that when you diversify on the land, and the idea is something like, I hope you've seen the film, The Biggest Little Farm. It is such an excellent demonstration of what we've been writing about and speaking about. You know, it shows how in a very short period, you can take land that has been dead from monocropping, but dead, almost incapable of producing anything. But by focusing on the key element, diversification, you're able to produce dramatically more than you ever can with monoculture. And you can create a thriving home, not just for the crops that you're selling to a market relatively close to the farm, uh, and relatively close can even be hundreds of miles away, but it's, you're not shipping across the world and you're not a serf to a giant anonymous market or corporation. And when you do that, you also create a thriving home for wildlife at the same time. And you create much more enjoyable uh, livelihoods and more livelihoods. So it is a, it's a movement that shows you can have more meaningful jobs, far more productivity, and at the same time, you're reducing the ecological footprint. And you're doing that in, an, again, just a multitude of ways, including that you're using much less packaging, much less transport, much less refrigeration. So I can't stress enough how important it is for us to support that movement and to realize that just because you might have some farmers markets in your town or city, it's not enough. We need to give it much more support. We should be looking at a goal of something like, as some people are doing now in the local food movement around the world, they're trying to have us a, a, an idea about 80% of the food consumed in an area from the region and about 20% imported. Um, so that's the... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I um, I love the farmers market movement. Um, I think it's the, one of the most inspiring um, examples of localization in action, um, and and understanding the um, the way kind of diversification enables the flourishing of of all life can really um, highlight why localization is so important. So it's like when you're, when you're understanding seeds um, and the need for seed saving, and that being one of the traditional ways of indigenous cultures or, or traditional cultures of surviving, exchanging of seeds and then having um, resilient crops that can withstand many different types of weather patterns. Um, and, and the fact that um, kind of co corporate um, genetic modification and um, such would try and dis make that elite, elite like not allowed um, and but then seeing now the rise in people interested in planting their own fruit and vegetables, like during coronavirus, um, I heard that a lot of the seeds were out of stock. Everybody was starting to become more interested in growing their own food and buying more from the local vicinity. And suddenly it was, you weren't allowed to leave your small area. So it was what shops are in my short small area. How can I connect to the local farmers in this, in this, in this, um, in, in my region? Um, did you find there was a lot of interest in your work um, it, during the coronavirus peak? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I found a lot of people also who have known about our work suddenly say, wow, you know, now is clearly this huge awakening. And, and it has been. It's been very, very hopeful. But, you know, I was talking earlier about the fork in the road. And that's what we do need to be more aware that, particularly around food and farming, 
the corporate pressure on national governments and now even working with the FAO are pushing for an even more energy intensive path where we would be 100% of humanity pushed into bigger and bigger cities and often in the name of smart green cities. And there would be smart agriculture using robots linked to drones, linked to satellites. So that's where we all need to be really aware of not unconsciously supporting that and actually speaking out against it. And this pressure now for 5G is part of that. It's a pressure for us to also be using driverless cars more and more. Now, can't we just sit back and think about on a really crowded planet, why would we in any way right now want to replace people with high quality energy, scarce energy and electronic, very resource intensive, mineral intensive ways of doing things? I mean, it's just, you know, people are already going crazy being dumped on some rubbish heap in big cities with meaningless work or no work and the intense competition and artificial scarcity of jobs when there's so much work to be done and so much fun and meaningful work. You know, all the things we need to do to nurture life back to life needs people. You know, even on those farms, the fact that people can pay attention to picking only that apple that's ripe, not some blind robot that comes along and picks everything and then burns half of it, but gently and carefully nurturing life back to life. It's actually something people really enjoy, but we need to make it possible to do that with the respect and the remuneration that that reserve deserves. It's the only real economy we have. It's the living world and the tending to the soil, to the water, to every tree is an absolute necessity now. Just as important is to realize that just as we've been replacing people on the land with farming and factory farming, factory farming, the pears and the apples, but also the animals, creating more and more cruel, polluting, hideous ways of dealing with life, with our animals, we have actually been factory farming our children and we are factory healthcare is what we've created. A way of dealing with ourselves where we become an anonymous number and where the, the flux and change of people, whether it's in the hospital or whether it's in the supermarket or in schools and in other educational institutions, we're limiting the number of people who can be there to care and to do the educational process, the healthcare in a human, intelligent, kind and caring way. We need more nurses and doctors per patient. We need more teachers per student. Why don't we have them? Entirely because we're choosing to subsidize, tax and regulate so that more and more energy and technology replaces people and more and more profit, artificial money, gets siphoned off into a casino. So there's a very clear path of what we need to do. But the clear path means that we do need to step back and look at the policy changes. How do we shift taxes, subsidies and regulations, which is how Governments are shaping the direction of our entire world. They're shaping our future with using those mechanisms at the moment to support not just the robots and the satellites and drones, but it's on a path that is competitive and we're going off to Mars to fight over scarce resources, deciding We've used the earth enough. Let's just go off there and let's compete and let's have these male egos drive this process. On the other side, billions of people are already demonstrating either in traditional ways of living or in the new path that's actually much bigger than we realize where people are actually deeply, intuitively 
aware that they want to return to more community, to more connection to nature. And there is this trend in virtually every field where you see in front of every word, eco, you know, eco-theology, eco-literacy, eco-architecture, ecological agriculture. That's a, an intuitive, large vote for let's treat the earth better. But you also have huge evidence of let's treat people better. Let's create more human scale, more just, and at the same time, ecological economies. And that really is what the localization movement is about. Maybe I'm being too broad and going on and on. I don't know if you wanted to. It's inspiring. When you talk about um, care and attention, um, I feel like part of your face lights up. Yeah. um, And you get a sense of um, joy in the humanness and the connection that you get from community through connecting to other people, to the land, to the earth. And you mentioned at the beginning Gaia, so kind of that deep connection to natural living systems in opposition to kind of a squeezing system that's so not human and kind of deathly in in, in comparison. Um, what keeps you going? What's kept you going all of these decades? And what helps you to keep that sense of connection um, through everything? Well, I mean, for me, you know, I, I had my eyes open to this from, you know, deep experience in indigenous culture. And so I had discovered these people who are so incredibly joyous, you know, living in this remote part of Tibet that belonged to India. And I, uh, from that time, which is the mid-70s, I became absolutely convinced that this system is not there because human beings are innately greedy or aggressive. This system has grown up, and by pushing people away from each other and from the land, it has just become this machine-like path that we call progress. But it was so obvious that The problem is not innate human tendencies. Instead, it's just our blindness. So I've been forever, for 45 years, trying to get this message out that it's possible for us to return home to much more human-scale community and connection to nature. And because for these 45 years, I've been absolutely convinced that it's not only possible, but I've seen that it's happening. And I've even had the pleasure of knowing that I've contributed to some of it. And so I, um, what definitely keeps me going is not only my faith and love of nature, but my faith in people and my love of people and the incredible joy I get when every day I hear of new examples of how people who have been You know, sometimes their whole life have known nothing but abuse, nothing but anger, and themselves have been angry and bitter. And, you know, so I've seen prisoners who have been like that, but helped to actually, you know, encouraged to start relating in in community to others who have also suffered, but with the help of people who encourage a deep, sharing a heart felt open human exchange being able to be vulnerable being able to say i'm you know i've been made to feel like i'm useless i've been made to feel like i'm nobody when people realize that actually others feel exactly the same way and when we wake up to the fact that this system has made most people feel that way what starts happening is this connection that we all long for. We all basically long to be appreciated, heard, and loved. And this system has prevented that in a way that we have often taken on. We have often subconsciously been so afraid of exposing our problems and we've been trained to believe we've got to seem perfect to be loved, got to be wealthy to be loved, got to be important to be loved. And being important now means more and more on a global stage. Otherwise, you're nobody. So this 
understanding that helping people to connect deeply, to expose their vulnerabilities, to share a journey, can turn hardened prisoners, torture victims, juvenile delinquents around in a very short period. Now, knowing that and getting more and more evidence of that, seeing more and more therapists, more and more therapists also aware of this, um, you know, that just, yeah, it, it's, it's what keeps me going. And because I also every day get so much good news in my inbox of these things happening, I'm able to stay motivated. I think probably if I were working only in a local area, I might not see the change so rapidly. And that's why I guess even though it's been hard to work globally, I'm sort of grateful for all these connections from every continent and getting more information. Um, I also think that part of what's the really huge leap now is not only connecting people heart to heart, in circle, vulnerable, but simultaneously connecting them to the earth. And in a, often in a deep, also practical way, which happens in the local food movement, leads to an even more exponentially successful way of healing people and nature at the same time. So, yeah, there's a, an amazing spiritual, psychological healing that comes from that reconnection. Yeah. I read um, an interesting study that was saying that when the brain... The brain cannot be in the, in the trauma state and a state of curiosity at the same time. Like they're two different states. And I feel like curiosity is the beginning of a sense of openness to connection and, um, and kind of the beginning of the state that will allow kind of joy and all of these feelings to arise. And, and, it's, and it's how can we change from the trauma state of de deconnection and separation and isolation through kind of curiosity and openness to kind of deeper deeper connection and it is such a powerful message the one of connection um, yeah I'm not sure that I would say that curiosity is the main element to me curiosity requires already a certain degree of healing mm -hmm. I guess for me it's you know the first step is to to create enough of a secure and loving environment for the traumatized person or people. And, and so that this is where I love the work that where the therapists or, you know, that understand this help people to come together uh, where several have been equally wounded. And the once they start feeling that not only the sort of um, the connection. So Helena, we're really excited because at the end of the month, um, Local Futures is doing a World Localization Day for the first time. Um, and it's got the most incredible lineup. Dalai Lama has even um, recommended and given a special letter of, of um, commendation. And could you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, well, it is June 21st, so it's not the end of the month, June, June 21st, and we decided to put a whole bunch of international conferences that we're normally doing around the world online, and we do have, so we have this web-based event that it now includes, you know, Russell Brand, and Annie Lennox, Johan Hari, George Mombio, um, uh, yeah, and a whole range of people from around the world to show that there is this amazing, inspiring, grassroots, worldwide localization movement. Many people are actually engaged in this reconnection, this connection of more human scale institutions that rebuild community and that rebuild a deeper experiential connection to nature are not necessarily seeing themselves as part of a worldwide movement. And so often, because most of these initiatives are quite small, 
people don't realize how significant they are. And, and that's true, both of the people who are doing it and also people out there who have not even heard about this and who don't realize that there is a set of lenses, there's a perspective where when we view things more holistically, there is this systemic direction that has this enormous healing potential and that can start healing people in a very profound way very quickly. So there is this path of personal healing and planetary healing where things are actually coherent, where there is a, there is a, a, a very clear, accountable, visible way where you can feel so much more empowered and, and part of something that you can feel is truly a big solution. So I so hope that people will join us to hear voices from around the world. It's, it's not going to be a perfect program of excitement, and, but I really think that people will be so moved and feel empowered to know that, that there are so many people around the world uh, engaged in this really world-changing path a new systemic way forward. Mm. It's got some of the most amazing speakers. Um, and yeah, it's going to be such a great program. And is that on, what's the website for that? What, where could people buy tickets? Yeah, the website is worldlocalizationday.org. Worldlocalizationday.org. Uh, and Ruby, we hope, is going to be doing some yoga. Yeah. Because part of localizing is becoming more grounded, grounded in ourselves, connected. It's the, the word for localization is essentially connection. It's, first of all, reconnecting our brain so that we're not just operating out of the left brain and chattering away, but we actually allow ourselves a feeling of peace by allowing the right brain to have a bit of a... Of a, a a pause and a chance, and it's about reconnection between our minds and our hearts and our bodies. By the way, as we learn more about localization, we also connect to all this new science that recognizes the gut biome and the soul biome as being completely connected. And so we start getting grounded in the earth and at the same time in ourselves. And so this is why we also want to have a little bit of yoga on the way as we're listening to some arguments that, you know, both describe a bit about globalization, but primarily it's about localization. And so we're very grateful to Ruby for offering to help us with some yoga on the journey. It's a privilege. Thank you so much, Helen, for your time today. Um, appreciate it so, 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 so much um, to hear your wisdom and to help us all with the deeper understanding of the system and of localization of clear, identified routes to kind of happier, healthier people on the planet, more in connection with, with, with everything. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Ruby. I think you were one of the great women activist in the world today. So I'm very oh. happy to be working with <laughs> what, what an honor, if that's true. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true, really true. <laughs>